the second thing, reason wise, and I understand this reason. This is why I'm in my brain pro marriage, I would say. Um, it's because it's the financial stability. That's true too, but you can have that without marriage. But listen, I, I mean, I, I mean, I've worked in the funeral industry for the majority of my whole entire life, and I've I've seen so many men die who are in those kind of things, and then the wife don't get left with shit. I mean, then the wife, the, the partner, don't get left with shit because yeah. technically that person, that woman has no rights. She has no rights to the house unless he did it in a will, which most men are not doing, and I feel like most women are not smart enough to make these men do. Um, they, they, they walk away with nothing, and a lot of these men already have kids from outside of this partnership, right? And this is the danger of, I feel like, a woman dating a man with kids and don't get married, is that the kids are going to be the beneficiaries on the life insurance policies. The kids are going to get the house. The kids are going to kick your ass out of that house if dad dies. Because they probably don't like you from Jump Street. You know? And I feel like if you're in that kind of situation, I understand getting married. Or like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like I women... Understand a prenup. Hmm? I understand a prenup. You're in that kind of situation. You need a I prenup. I understand a prenup too. And, Right. And a lot of women bat their eyes or the skirt or just, like, oh, a prenup. And I'm like, but a prenup protects both parties. It really yes. does. Yeah. We, we have life insurance. We have life. We have life insurance. We have auto insurance. We have all these insurances. Not because I'm planning on going out there and getting an accident. It's there just mm. in case. Yeah. Just in case the worst happens. And that's what a prenup is. Just in case the worst happens. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing is that I'm. Personally, I'm never going to get married, but Lord knows, I all my friends are married. I've been to all those weddings. I've been bridesmaids. I've got, you know, the, what do they call that, 21 dresses or 13 dresses or whatever the hell they call that movie. Yeah, I've been, I've done a lot of that in my day. But um, I've watched, I've watched plenty of people that get married that lead to um, great relationships. I can think of like yeah. two or three off the top of my head that are happier than most couples I know. So I don't think it's the, like, I don't think marriage like tears people apart or anything personal like that. I mean, personally, I, I like I used to work in the wedding industry for a long time too. Uh, so I seen a lot of weddings, a lot of different types of weddings. I seen one bride that um, had a whole Mickey Mouse themed wedding, and then I had seen I had seen one bride that walked down the aisle to Slayer. It was brilliant. Oh, I loved nice. it. <laughs> Oh, great. I thought I panicked because I thought I put on the wrong song and then I turned around and she coming down. I'm like, oh, OK, no, it's great. Great. Perfect. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but that's the thing is I'm marriage is an institution I don't have a problem with. I mean, religion is an institution I don't have a problem with all these things. I'm a firm believer in personal beliefs. Right. So it's like pro-choice. I'm very pro-choice. I think whatever whatever choices you would make for yourself that work for you, I think that that's what you should do. That includes, you know, everything from abortion to religion to marriage to whatever. If you like mm -hmm. it, I love it. The only thing that I expect is that people allow me the same room and freedom to make my choices that may not, may or may not align with what most people think I should do. And so it's been in my experience that most of the people in my life that I don't necessarily align with my views have always been really supportive. So it's really been easy for me to work with people that I don't necessarily agree with because I don't see them as the enemy. I have so many people in my life that are great to me and have been a huge influential factor in my life that are completely different, like completely different side of the field for me. But disagreeing doesn't change the fact that they're there for me when I need them, um, that, you know, they might believe in this religious thing and I don't, or this political thing and I don't, but none of that changes the relationship that we have. And I think that a lot of people have started to take some of these things way too seriously. And hopefully the book will shine some light on some of that for them. Yeah. And, and I totally agree with you. I, I feel like of age, I feel like anybody under 18, no, I, I, no, you can't make any decision. Listen, if I had a 16 year old son, he said that, you know, he wants to chop his dick off. No, wait till you're 18 and make that decision. <laughs> Somebody get canceled but because of it. I but, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like, make, wait, be 18 and you make that decision on your own. You know what I mean? As an adult where you can, because I mean, I, if I 
if I if my parents let me make every stupid decision that I wanted to make as a kid, I would probably be a drug addict by now. Mm. I I mean I'm I'm like you said under eighteen. I feel the same way about pretty much everything across the board. Yeah. Um, you want to do anything permanent? You're gonna wait till you're eighteen because no I'm not tattoos. No, no tattoos, tattoos. And, and I see so many underage kids walking around with tattoos, and I'm like, huh? The thing for me is, is that it's permanent. If you're going to do anything that's permanent, you're going to wait until you're old enough to make that decision for yourself. I will not make that decision on your behalf. I won't. Yeah. Um, and so my kids understand that. And it's the same, like, if you get into the um, transgender kid thing, I'm more than willing to support my kids. Like, um, say my daughter. I will be too. Right? I'll go cut your hair. We'll buy you new clothes. We'll buy you a different name. None of that stuff bothers me. None of it. None of it bothers me. Um, I would love to be nothing more than, I just want happy, healthy children. I don't care. Sure what they end up doing as long as, and they're happy that's it um so the expectation for what they turn out to be isn't there but i'm also somebody that write a horror novel about religion so i'm pretty open-minded yes <laughs> that helps i agree with you i'm not in, in, with a child no permanent decisions right because as a parent you're making a decision for your child allow that's- that child to be an adult and make that decision on your own that's it. And that's all I want from them is that if you're going to make a permanent decision, then you need to make that decision for yourself. I will not do it for you. Yeah, so I'm not signing off on it or anything. No, that's right. your decision. Right. Then that's the thing. Is, well, you just have to sign off on it. No, that's the same as me making the decision for yeah. you. I sign it. I'm saying, yeah, you're going to do this. And no, 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 no. Um, I don't care what they do. They could tattoo their whole face for all I care into yeah. lizard people. <laughs> I'm not, not shook. Sure. Do whatever you want, um, but just I want them to be fully cognitive when they make the decisions and understand the possible repercussions or the possible um, um, circumstances that could result. So yeah. once that they're that they're mature enough to make those decisions with the full power that they can use in their brain, uh, then I'm completely behind it, 100 percent, whatever they decide to do. So they both know that, and I think they're pretty cool with it. So if they need anything, though, they can always talk to me. They can tell me whatever they need, and I would never send them away. I would just might suggest different alternatives as a solution, but I might I'd like I'd never turn my back on them. But it's um, it's funny. I say all this about my kids, and I kill off so many kids in my book. <laughs> <laughs> it, like so many. <laughs> now, like, this wait, is... she loves kids. I do. Now, this is... I promise. <laughs> Now, this is the fun part of the interview. If you see my interviews, I'm going to ask you a random question. All right. So since we're talking about cults and religion and all that good stuff, what are five characteristics that you think makes a great cult leader? A great cult leader? A yes. successful cult leader? Yes, or a, a great successful, leader? effective cult leader. Uh, uh, Joel Osteen. No, I'm yeah. joking. <laughs> Well, let's let's picture this now. Well, so you have to be charismatic, right? You have to be yeah. oratory. You've got to be able to speak and have people listen to you. Um, you've got to present a problem. You've got to present a problem that exists that you have the solution for. Um, you have to convince people that you're the only one that has that solution, because. If they're convinced you're the only one that has the solution, then they're much more willing to go further for you than if they think that they can get that resolution somewhere else. Um, what do we say? Five? Five. Five. Um, you've got to spread the word. You've got to be able to um, be seen and heard without being seen and heard. Like you've got to be able to walk that fine line where you're recruiting but you're not being overzealous and kind of presenting yourself to everybody right off hop. You've got to have literature. You've got to have some kind of literature that is going to be a serve as a guidebook to all your followers to tell them what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do, and what the consequences of whatever action will be. And uh, finally, you've got to be violent. You've got to be willing to be violent, at least, um, because there is inevitably going to be somebody that steps out of line and you're going to need to make, be able to make an example out of them. So you de- need to have that personality that is able to be merciless when you have to be. Okay. All right. So that's, that's pretty good. So Perfect. the second follow-up question on that, you're a cult leader now. Who would your victims, I mean, not victims, your members be? Like, who would you go after? Like, what group would you be like, these are easy marks, these are easy targets, I know I can get them to follow me to the edge of the earth. Trump followers. 
and I don't say that as a political thing. The reason, the reason I say that is because very, right now they're very disillusioned and very angry with the whole system. They're looking for an answer, and you need to. And if you can provide them one, then they will follow you. And it's because I don't say that because they follow Trump. I say that because that right now in the political environment that we're in, they are the most dis- disillusioned and then the most angry. So they would be the easiest pickings. You tell them they already know what their well, they think they know what their problem is, right? And you offer them a solution to that problem, like, oh no, we're online. I don't want to say that. Um, but if you offer them a solution to that problem, <laughs> what, is your, that, what is yours then? What would you what offer if, them? What would I offer them? Mm-hmm. Kill all Hispanics and Blacks, or what? Or is that? No. <laughs> but, but I, I don't know. If all females on the head with that one. I would say, um, I disassemble the government. I would tell them I'm going to oh. disassemble the government, and rebuild it. Not to give anybody any ideas, but and you wouldn't even give them. But you wouldn't even give them what that would even look like. You you just toss that idea out there. I just throw it out there, and I'd say that it needs to be done because I know that it's something that they already agree with. So I throw it out there and say that it needs to be done. And then I would set forth plan action on how I'm going to do it. I'm going to get elected to Congress. I don't know that much about your guys' government, but let's say uh, I'm going to get elected to Congress. And then I'm going to fight off all the Democrats. I'm going to get elected to the Speaker House so I can get that gavel and I can pass these laws. And these laws will lead to that laws. And then I'll confuse everybody with what I'm going to do after that. And they'll just be like, that's like a great plan. And they'll go for it because most people that are that easily led don't know that much about government either. And so they'll take what's fed to them is truth so if you tell them oh i'm gonna go become speaker of the house and then once i'm speaker of the house i can be president you know what i mean and they won't know the difference they'll be like all right cool that sounds like a great plan let's do that but that's all it takes is to take really disillusioned people really disillusioned scared angry people and give them an exit that's all it takes so that's what i tell them you're angry at the government the government's caused all these problems like what they caused you know biden did this trump did this it's all the government and this is how we're going to fix it and I think that it would something like that would take off relatively quickly. If you look at John Fetterman, right? The reason that everybody, when you talk to Trump supporters and you ask them, why did you vote for Trump? I overwhelmingly got a lot of the same answer, which was he's not a politician. So everybody's looking for this person that's not a politician because they're sick of the way the politicians deal with things, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look at John Fetterman that ran against Dr. Oz, he was your everyman and he won by a landslide. And that's because I think people are looking for that every man, someone that they can relate to. Politicians used to work for the people. It doesn't work like that anymore. The people work for the politicians to line their pockets. So, you know, you guys have your donors or whatever for different parties. And those donors have different requests, you know, minimum, lower minimum wage and whatever. And if you do that, then we're going to give you the X, Y, Z amount of money. They line their pockets by doing these things. When the whole idea of democracy first started, the idea was that you were going to have someone that was elected by the people to represent them that they knew that came from their community. And then that person would go off to Washington and represent them with the rest of the politicians. That doesn't happen anymore. Most people don't even know who leads in their state. Nope. And because the person, whoever it is that leads in their state, I'm going to leave, leave some names out that are quite obvious. But um, I mean, Ron DeSantis, let's take him for example, has Florida, right? Has the highest population of the aging community in a good portion of your guys' country. And he does nothing about healthcare, but he's running around banning books. Why? Like the reason that these people don't know who some of these people are or who they're voting for or whatever is because these people make no difference in their lives. If someone came along and all of a sudden your minimum wage went from, I don't know, $12 an hour to $18 an hour, you would know who did that. You would know who was responsible for that. The reason that people don't know is because they don't do anything. They don't do anything to make their lives better. The only ones that that people know when it comes to politicians anymore are the ones they hate. Look at people. Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene and people like that, like their their names are all over the news. And it's because people love talking about what they hate and they hate them like the Matt Gates and all these people like they get more news time than anybody that's actually doing anything because that's boring. Yeah. Lauren Boebert, I think, is the one that was like jerking off her man at the Beetlejuice thing. And everybody's like played all over CNN and everything like 1500. Like this is what you're covering. Like, I mean. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a huge fan either, but I mean, there are more important things that could be covered than this. Um, and that's the thing is that it's just become, and it's not, again, it's not just down there, it's up here too. We get the same thing, it's same shit, different pile. Uh, but it's it's become a three ring circus, nothing's getting done, and everybody's at each other's throats because we're struggling. And even when I see people that disagree with me, when they get that angry, there's a part of me feels bad for them because I know why you're angry. 
I get it. You're struggling everywhere, and nobody cares. Everywhere. Like, I don't think the news, I don't, I don't know about in Canada, but in this country, the news doesn't talk about how bad it is in the country. But let me tell you something right now. The average person in this country is doing bad. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, they're, they're they're struggling, and and shit is expensive. Everything's expensive. The wages are not going up. No one's buying anything. I mean, in this country, people don't buy new cars anymore. So what did they do? People are buying used cars. So what did they do? They raked up the exactly. prices of, of used cars. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing. You see it all through. Like we talk a lot about the Republicans, but even if you go on the Democrat side, AOC, right? I used to be a big fan of that girl. I loved her chutzpah. That girl was out there every day, the spark in that girl's eye. But then I show her up, see her showing up to the floor and like Jimmy Choo and Louis Vuitton. And I'm like, oh, okay, we're doing that now. Because yeah. this girl, you have mis- mismatched blazers and pants and the glasses and the whole. Mm-hmm. She was doing way more impressive work then than she's been doing since. And it's become almost like a fashion show. And you can see it with Democrats. The only person that's never sold out, Bernie Sanders. That yeah. guy, don't give a shit about money at all. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. he, he wears recycled mittens. Like, he's old suits. Like, he does not care. And that's the thing is that um, Bernie's really old, too. But I would love to see somebody that has that kind of courage to stand by their convictions like Bernie does that would come up a little bit younger. But I thought it was going to be the AOC, but then she seemed to kind of sell out, too. So you see a lot of repeat of the same things that you've seen back in the day with people like Nancy Pelosi and things like that. Although these people are Democrats or liberals in our case in Canada, I do have liberal points of view, but I would never align myself with some of these people. No. They're I, I think their threshold is way off. See, I'm right in the in the middle. I, I consider myself a uh, conservative liberal. Like, I yeah. th- there's a lot of conservative stuff I agree with. Yeah, yeah, me too. You know what I mean? It's a lot. Yeah. And there's a lot of liberal stuff I agree with. But yeah. here's the thing. I don't agree with the far left and the far right. That's it. Those the fars. Those yeah. fars. And I feel like on either side, majority majority of conservatives are far right, and majority of liberals are far left. Yeah. I and I can't and I can't jump on either side because it's too extreme. Yeah. And that's why you said you said Alexandria Cortez. I don't. I never liked her because she's too extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Liberal. Well, I like her, I like her chutzpah, right? And even that, like, I find that most people are like you and me where they find themselves more centric. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think that the extremists that you're talking about are the ones that are the loudest and they make themselves heard the most. And I think that they become the representation for both parties when in reality, they're not the representation at all. I talk to more people that believe like you and I do than people that are extreme on either side. You run across them every once in a while, but they're definitely the minority. I mean, at least here in Canada, I can't speak for you guys in the States. No, no, no. I know far here. left, I mean, far right, far left. Like, and you run it's into ch- some people who fit in the middle, you, you run, but, it's, but it's a smaller percentage. Yeah. Well, the whole idea of your system was to, like, democracy was to bring together different ideas and find a way to coexist. Because even as far back as you go, you used to have Romans that would um, get up on the hill and argue with each other for hours Mm -hmm. to work out some of the things that we consider to be basic principles these days. So the fact that they have stopped being able to disagree with each other without wanting to kill each other is going to do nothing but retire our whole society. It's going to send it nowhere backwards. But I'm going to tell you how bad it is in this country. I did a video when I first started. It was called Five Things I Hate by Horror Conventions, right? Okay. And I was getting death threats. I mean, like, bad comments. Really? I had to, like, bad comments from people who just didn't agree with me. Oh, wow. Well, they're going to love this then. Yeah, I know, Exactly. (laughs) But I'm like, whoa, like you you can't say, oh my goodness, okay, you don't like stinky people at conventions. Well, I, I like stinky people. It's like, so like, you know what I mean? Well, that's your opinion. What? Uh, it's weird. Yeah. Well, it just seems to me that if you're going to be that upset about it, maybe you're one of the stinky people at the convention. Probably so. I know. <laughs> just throwing it up there. But I, I mean, to get mad at somebody because they don't agree with you, it just seems so counterintuitive to me. I don't learn anything by talking to people that I agree with. Like, I never have. And 
I can oh I love good debate. I love a good debate. I love a good, good debate. If you can come at me with things that are real and you can open your mind a little bit to say something like, oh, you know, I never knew that. That's kind of cool. I never seen it. You know what I mean? You're flexible in what you're thinking, but you're coming at me with things that are real and mm-hmm. you know you're you have the courage to stand by your convictions. But like, I love a good debate. I will not argue with people though. Arguing no. and debating two completely different things. I will not argue with you. I'm not out to prove anything to you. But if you want to have a healthy discussion about something that we don't agree about, then I'm game for that. Yeah. But once people start um, getting degrading or calling names, they start or anything, insulting. I, yeah. But I but, my, but I am. Listen, I am mature enough that if you bring to me some evidence that COVID, uh, yeah. for instance, that, that for instance COVID is not real, right? You bring some evidence. Hey, listen. This is a proof. I got some hidden documents right here that this was all a scam, right? Yeah. I'm mature, intelligent enough to be like, holy shit, you are 100% right. correct. Yeah. But if you tell me that COVID is not real and don't have nothing to back it up, that's, I don't want to listen to you. And that's it. I'm a huge fan of a good conspiracy theory. I love a good conspiracy theory. If you got like, what about this? What about this? And they all actually tie in together. Like I get really intrigued. But if you come to me and you're like, well, like you said, COVID's not real. I'm like, cool. Well, how do you know that? And they're like, exactly. Well, I read it on BuzzFeed and I'm like, oh my God, I don't have time for this. Is this like, a competition. Because it's a competition here that's called a face of heart contest. I don't know if you've seen my I've videos. Seen I've but- seen that. But I actually did actual evidence and research to show it was a fucking scam. Now, some people just don't even fucking watch the video and they're just, oh, it's not a scam because it was a scam, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, did you even watch the fucking video? Did you even watch the fucking video to show what I'm saying is a scam? Yeah. Well, that's the thing, though, is I, it just seems to me that you just must be a person that wants to win. That's fine. Yep. You know, you're Cinderella. Get your shoes on, girl. Like, go yep. dance the night away. That's fine with me. When you find out that the Prince Charming's a toad, don't come back and watch the video then. But that's, <laughs> but, I, I, seen, I seen the whole face of horror thing, and um, it reads to me the same way. It's I, a scam. I had a bunch of people send it to me, and I was just like, yeah, no, there's there's, a, there's, there's so many red flags all over the place. If I'm proven wrong, then I'll stand corrected. I will, uh, too. I'm, Hope somebody wins it, whatever. And if they do, shoot me a line because I want to see that cover. But but, um, but I'm telling you what, what, right now, I I I put out an offer for Jim Belladola, what the fuck his name is, who's the guy who runs it, to come on my show, and and he agreed to, and then took it back. So like, if you are, if you're running a legit competition, I'm your biggest. I am your biggest fucking threat because no one else has made a face of horror scam video. Yeah, It's me. I'm the face of horror scam guy. So, yeah. like, why wouldn't you come on my show to argue the point? Yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, it's it, uh, if you're going to um, put together something like that and then someone's going to challenge it, wouldn't your first instinct be to jump to defend it? Attack like, it. Right. Because that's the thing. If somebody came to me and they were like, "Oh, well, you didn't do any research for this book," I'd be, I'd be on it, on if, it. If, if if this was untrue, Jim Vildola would have attacked it instantly. Yeah, exactly. He would have attacked it. He would have put something out. This guy is full of shit. Here is here's the proof that that we are donating this money to this fundraiser. Here's the proof. He would have been all over it. Yeah, yeah, and that's well. I mean. Sometimes inaction speaks louder than words. Yeah. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be too concerned. But like I said, when I seen the whole thing, a bunch of people sent it to me and I took a look at it. You see that like little intro video or whatever that they send you? And I was just like, yeah, no, I was I'm in good. it last year. I, I, I was in, in it last year and that's what pissed me off the most because I got duped. I was like, oh, I, I wish somebody would have told me that was a scam. No one told me it was a scam. But like, <laughs> and then I hate when I hear people are putting in the comments, well, you're bitter that you lost last year. I mean, you're bitter that you lost. I'm like, no, I'm bitter because I had a scam. A- anybody, that's a natural reaction to be bitter yeah. if you got taken advantage of. Exactly. And that's the thing is that if you feel like you've been preyed upon, taken advantage of, anything like that, then you're naturally going to feel some resentment. And as far as being bitter is concerned, I mean, yeah, you scam me. If a gypsy took me for 150 bucks, I'd be pretty pissed too. It doesn't doesn't mean I'm against every gypsy in the world. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> 
it's the thing is if that I empty every if, if I hacked into if, if this was all a scam right now and this whole entire time I'm hacking into your bank account stealing all your, all your money and you go to the cops and it's like well listen you you, you sure knew it was a scam you would feel a little bit bitter yeah yeah that's it is that I mean I've seen a lot of people that go for it to the whole um, face of horror thing I mean they do make it very convincing and it I. Does. I get where people want that kind of thing, but there are some legit competitions online that you can, you know, not exactly the face of horror kind of thing, but there are other things that you can invest yourself in that are better investments of your time. If your your whole thing is to be on the cover of a horror magazine, I mean, there's better ways to do it. Become a serial killer. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. Like, <laughs> no, but I'm talking about, but, but you're not even on the cover on, on the phone. You, you got some shitty looking pictures that that someone took on the iPhone and they submitted it to Rogue Morgue. I can some I can submit a picture right now saying, "Hi, I'm Travis from Harlem," and it could be put into Rogue Morgue. You know what I mean? Like it's not that hard to do. And Kane to meet Kane Hodder, I met him twice. It's it's like forty or bucks, and he'll he'll take a picture and do an autograph with you. So that's forty bucks to stay in that hotel that they're staying in. You only stay in one night. You only pay for one night, by the way. I mean, it's like five hundred dollars. So like you're adding it up and it doesn't make any sense. And then yeah. and, and, and then the grand prize, the taxable amount for the prize is thirty thousand dollars. Not the thirteen thousand dollar cash, but thirty thousand dollars. So they're they're gonna tax you on thirty thousand dollars and it says in the in the fine print too that the taxes are gonna be taken out of your prize money. So think yeah. about it. Taxes off of thirty thousand dollars is by eight grand. So you're yeah. not even getting thirteen grand. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. I don't I don't know. Horror I don't know if it's our genre that's easy to pick on. <laughs> it is, it is, it is. And but, and, I, and, I, and I said it in my last video, I said horror fans are horror fans have a lot of expendable money. You know what I mean? Like they sure. spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on horror conventions, autographs. Yeah, we have tons of ex we have tons of extra money, you know. And if you ask me the reason why that is, I'm gonna lose all my subscribers. But um, <laughs> I just wait. Everybody pause before we get. I'm gonna lose. I'm gonna lose all my subscribers. So I'm not gonna say. It. But um, y'all can just guess the reason. I'm gonna say why we have a lot of extra money. But um, but well, I, I don't know. I uh, I find that the some horror fans like you get some that are extreme collectors and then you have some that are experienced nuts you know what i mean like they want to experience yeah. they don't care if they collect it they want to experience it they want to experience the haunted house they want to experience like and then you have I'm a, some that are i'm a mixture of both like gatherers. <laughs> but i think the reason okay i'm gonna tell you one of the reasons why i think the reason why we have a lot of expendable cash is because we don't spend money on materialistic shit. We don't buy expensive cars. We don't buy expensive shoes and clothing. We shop at Walmart. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't think horror fans spend a lot of money on materialistic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like the hat you're wearing, I have the exact same one and I've been wearing it for like, I'd say the better part of 20 years. Like, I love it. <laughs> and, and, People are like, I can buy another one. I'm like, I don't need any when I have this one. And it's, I'm just, thrifty ain't the word. I Maybe lazy is. I don't know. I just don't, like, when I have a t-shirt that I love, I don't want to find another t-shirt. I'm just going to wear this until it falls off. <laughs> I don't put a lot of money into clothes. I mean, yeah, that no. sounds awful. But uh, <laughs> I, I don't put need money into work them. clothes. <laughs> like, like, my work clothes, suits, and stuff like that, I spend money on. But, like, just every day walking around clothes, I really don't. I don't look like a bum. I hope I don't. But um, but like I feel like I feel like I go to a horror convention. I'm one of the dress, one of the best dress horror people out there. I mean, I've, I don't even been to a horror convention, but like, Absolutely. yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm you know, I'm, 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 I just I don't get dressed up for a whole lot of stuff, and if I do, yeah. it usually lasts like 20 minutes, and then I'm like, where are my jeans and my hoodie? Yeah. So it's like a uniform for me now. It's been the same uniform since I was like a teenager. <laughs> but I just feel like you, you can pull a lot of. I feel like you can pull more money out of horror fans than you can. I mean, it's a it's, it's a brilliant scam. The, the whole contest is a brilliant scam. I mean, I, I wish I would have thought of that idea. Um, <laughs> if I was a horrible person, by the way. But um, 
impressive. <laughs> because I mean, it's an amazing scam. Because what does to be the biggest horror fan? What does that even mean? I thought it was funny that it meant pictures. That, like I thought when you say the biggest horror fan, I'm like, so you send a picture of a collection? And they're like, no, we want a picture of you. And I'm like, what? Like, the, can you see it? It's written on my forehead. Like, there's what am no, I missing? But that's why there's no video of you. There's, you don't have no resume. It's just like, here's my titty out, and I'm the biggest horror fan. Or like, I got makeup on my face, and my, like, what does that mean? Like, so like, yeah. I feel like if you're gonna find out who the biggest <laughs> horror fan, is, you, you gotta do some kind of American Idol type shit, you know? Like, yeah. With there should be some kind of page. Page. some like preliminary quiz that you have to pass before you can even be considered. Yeah, and then I feel like you got to stand on stage and, like, you know, and quote horror trivia, and they got to see in your house and see how many horror collectibles you have, and, like... That's funny, because if you came into my house, I don't have that many. I'm okay. a huge... My, like, my books behind me are my biggest... That's that's the biggest thing as far as horror yeah, I, that I... I don't have any... I don't have that many in my house, but if you go to my storage unit, there's tons. <laughs> yeah, a lot, but when I started having kids, I was like, I've got to get rid of this. It's going to scare the shit out of the kids. i got to get rid of this. It's going to scare the shit out of the kids. So a lot of it went when I had kids, but now that they're starting to become teenagers, they're getting older, then some of it's going to start to be replaced because, I mean, you're going to have to balls up because, I, yeah, because I've i been living for like 15 years without my horror stuff, and I got rid of a lot of stuff because it was too much for the kids. I remember I had this airbrush painting of the Grim Reaper. It was beautiful. And the, my friend that did it had put two little tiny dots of glow-in-the-dark paint where his eyes were. So when you shut off the lights, like, just his eyes would glow. It was so perfect. Mm-hmm. I used to scare the shit out of the baby, so I had to get rid of it. But so for a nice price. But it's, I've always loved, like, not, like, horror is, is a thing, but, like, gothic stuff in general. So even, like, with the book, the whole... Thing about like big gothic churches and stuff like that some of them are going to be um big um places in the coming books not so much in this book it's more of a rundown thing but we'll build to the grandiose of it all as we kind of go along but yeah no i mean as much as i've always been a horror fan i've always been a big fan of like gothic anything as well just the whole dark smoky feel of it you know what i mean yeah. all the black rays and earth tones and stuff like that i just love it but um, the biggest horror collection I have is definitely my books. Awesome. Mine is like Funko Pops. I have like Funko Pops. I mean, I mean, I literally got one right here sitting on my desk. This is Gabe from uh, Pet Cemetery. Uh, oh, that's so great. What's his name? Nico Hughes. I was at a convention and he signed it recently. Oh, uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. I have autograph shit all over the fucking place. Um, listen, I'm batting three for three when it comes to women horror authors. Three for three, great interviews. Thanks, man. Thanks. I mean, you're great. Like, I was super nervous, but you made it real easy. I tried to. I mean, we listen. We we, we talked about a whole thing. We, we we talked about churches, cults, scamming, marriage, kids, chopping off dicks. We we, we talked a lot about a lot of stuff. But most importantly, we talked about Rapture, which is actually right now available on Amazon. Yeah, where is it here? Yeah. Hold that. Yes. It's great. It's a great read. If you're looking for something good that you can lead into a new horror obsession, then it's something. I always love something I can dive into and be obsessed with for years. Guys, definitely check it out. I have the I have it on, on my Kindle, and it's a fun little read. Um, Carrie, how, how can everybody find you? How can you find me? Uh, well, yeah. you have TikTok, uh, the Afterworld series. Uh, same for Instagram is that the Afterworld series. Um, Facebook, we have a group, and you can follow me by my first and last name on Facebook as well. Awesome, awesome. Everybody, definitely check her out, and please hop on Amazon and get your copy of Rapture. Carrie, it's been an absolute pleasure. You can come on anytime. <laughs> oh, I'll be back. Oh, we'll be back. We'll do this again. Wait until the second book comes out. We'll do it again. Yes, we're definitely going to do it. We'll piss off a whole group of people. Yes, we're going to listen to every book when you come back. All right? Absolutely, man. (laughs) All right, everyone. Well, thank you for coming to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce. I'll see you guys next time. Take care.